Foresight, an Alpha Point series. David Patterson, Governor of New York, 2008 to 2010. Supported by Google, $39 Glasses, Mealy Associates, Golden Fortune, and Jack Molstein. Welcome to Foresight, an Alpha Point series of conversations with changemakers in the blindness community. I'm Scott Thornhill, and our guest is the 55th governor of the state of New York, David Patterson. Governor, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm happy to be here, Scott. This is quite a great program you have, and it's an honor to have been invited to be on the, the program. Yes. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to just um, start off, just just uh, hit the ground rolling here. Can you tell us just a little bit about your, um, your vision loss? I know it happened uh, at, at a young age, but would you just share with us a little bit about how you lost your vision? I suffer from optic atrophy, which is scarred tissue that lies between the retina and the optic nerve. And actually, the nerve is almost burned to a crisp. And this happened a lot in the 30s, 40s, and into the 50s with children that were incubated. But I was one of the few that somehow was diagnosed with optic atrophy that, that was not incubated. So. How the vision loss occurred is unknown. Um, some doctor told my parents that uh, an ear infection when I was three months old led to this. Every other ophthalmologist I've visited said that is categorically impossible. But if you Google me, it says that an ear infection created this disease. So I've just learned to roll with it. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Well, I know that that obviously early on, as it would with any you know any person, especially at a young age, you know, created some some obstacles and some challenges. And I know that education was was one of those. Would you tell us a, a bit about your education and, and fighting for that level playing field? Well, I was a client of Helen Keller Services, um, the Industrial Home for the Blind in uh, Brooklyn, New York. But when I became school age, the New York City public school system would not guarantee my mother that I'd be educated with the rest of the students. There weren't that many disabled students of any kind at the time. And so the general prognosis for them is that they be educated at great places like the Lavelle School for the Blind or other great schools. But my mother thought, as she told me years later, that whoever you go to school with is going to be who you socialize with and inevitably who you work with. And so she went to Westchester, New Jersey, Connecticut, and finally found a school in Long Island, the Hempstead Public School System, which is one of the top three school uh, systems in the state. And they told her they had already done this with other students, and if sh she would move her family to Hempstead, they would be proud to welcome me. Uh, well, my father was trying to start a political career in New York, and, but he was overruled and moved to Hempstead with a all, with the rest of us. You can tell who's running the show in that relationship. And then on my first day of school, the kindergarten teacher, Miss Stein, uh, told my mother that she would like for her to take me home for a week while she got the class calmed down. And then we would bring David in, as she put it. And uh, I was told, I was there, and I knew there was some sort of commotion, but I was too young to understand it. But I was told by a friend of my mother's that my mother said to the teacher, I will get your class settled down in 20 minutes. I'm a third grade teacher at PS116 in Queens. And in addition, while I'm settling them down, David will be with them as well. And so this feud led to an intervention by the principal of the school who ruled in my mother's favor. And while I would barely uh, want to compare it to the desegregation in Little Rock, I got in the class that way. By the way, Ms. Stein hated me for the whole year. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that. That's uh, I'm, I'm sure that wasn't probably wasn't easy for you or your or your mother. So I know that that can be a challenge. Um, so did you have role models for you uh, as you were growing up, whether they were visually impaired or not? Wh who were the people you looked up to? Well, the visually impaired person I looked up to was Stevie Wonder, and not because of the wonderful music that he plays, but he named his album The Talking Book. So he put it right out there that he listened to the talking book series that came from the American Foundation for the Blind and uh, that he was honoring them by naming one of his albums for their, that service. Later on, Stevie Wonder uh, had a situation where 
a number of people who were working for him betrayed him and he pretty much had to fire everybody who was around him and, you know, reconstitute his organization. And, and I really liked the way he then realized he was going to have to take more control of his life and that that help sometimes can be control. And so he was a real hero of mine. Uh, you know, there were obviously uh, some sports heroes, Roberto Clemente, the great uh, right fielder for the Pittsburgh Pirates and the the just zeal and and style that he played that other people called hot dogging, but uh, that was the way he played in Puerto Rico when he was growing up, and of course he was killed uh, taking aid uh, after a terrible uh, hur hurricane in Nicaragua, and I'm now on the Roberto Clemente board to find uh, equipment for young people to play baseball all over the country. Yeah. So as you as we fast forward just a little bit, you, you got into uh, Hofstra Law School. You graduated from Hofstra, but you, but you did not pass the bar, and it seemed to be part of that due to accommodations or lack of accommodations. Can you just share a little bit on that part? Well, during the time I took the bar exam, and I, th I think this period, uh, I took the bar exam in 1983, um, from, I think, 1981 to 1990, no blind person passed the bar exam in the state of New York. And the problem just was it takes so much time to go through the material. And even if the material is read, you're listening to it rather than the speed at which you could read it if you had the possibility to read. And even it was very difficult for to have Braille because it just so many different references that you use to take the bar exam that you just can't put everything in Braille because there were so few people that were using it. And that was very difficult for me. So I had gone through the Hampstead Public School System and actually graduated a year early. And then I went to Columbia University and I had the same problem at Columbia and at Hofstra, being, having low vision. It was hard for me to decide when I should be blind and when I should be sighted in the sense because I think it would have been better had I had all my material recorded by organizations like Recording for the Blind and uh, whether you could send them the book and they'd send it back in six weeks, as opposed to trying to grapple with just class notes. I, I think my performance was weakened by that. And then in, uh, obviously in law school, just to give you an example of how things affected me more than others, in the first year of law school, um, most of the energy is expended in being anxious. And everyone, everyone's afraid that they're going to get kicked out of the school. So there are many study groups. So there isn't that much reading, but there's a lot of talking back and forth, uh, debating cases and, and uh, having little moot court sessions where you go at it with your student colleagues. So I did very well after the first uh, uh, year at Hofstra. I had a B plus average. Then in the second year, it goes back the same way college is in that uh, you have your own schedule and you have your own courses. And these are the same problems I had as a college student at Columbia. And I'm just happy I graduated uh, law school before I flunked out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, me too, me too. I'm curious, do you think, in looking back, do you ever spend time thinking how things might have been different, career may have been different if you had? Uh, I think um, that although it was a great idea to send me to public school, I came to the conclusion while in public school that the less I bothered anyone, the more appreciated I would be. So when, uh, you know, there was writing on the blackboard and I couldn't see it, I just either got a friend to tell me about it or just listened. And this is not a good way to get an education. And I think I was very um, unable to address my issues. I had an itinerant teacher, a teacher that was sort of like the prelude to special education, would come and talk to me once a week. We'd spend a period together. But I never really complained about anything. And this would be uh, a real problem for me when I got to Columbia and also when I got to Hostra. And at one point, uh, when I was at uh, Columbia, I went to a barbecue over the summer and a gentleman asked two of uh, another guy my age and I to go out and get him 15 kids to pack lunches for students that were going to, to uh, summer school or summer camp. 
And uh, we went out and we got 13 kids and put our names on the list. He hired everyone except me. And I didn't even do anything about it except get upset about it. And uh, I told my parents about it. They didn't seem to understand. Finally, when they did, they sent a little polite message to the gentleman. They knew him, that they didn't appreciate the way he treated me. And that's when he put the final knife in my heart. Scott, you know what he did? He hired my brother. Ah, oh, nice. Who was underage, by the way. So he broke the law twice. And I went back to Columbia, and this is a point where I lost self-esteem completely. I couldn't pick up a book. I couldn't concentrate because I thought, why am I doing all this work if, in the end, I'm never going to get a job anywhere? And uh, But for an intervention of a professor who saved me from basically getting put out of Columbia, and his idea was to have me leave the school for a year, and he said, this time, you go look for a job and you fight for a job until you get one. And then you can come back here a year after you start it. Wow. And that was the best advice I ever got. That's and great. that changed my entire life. And it also annexed me to the idea of speaking for people who might have a voice, but don't use it. Yeah. So speaking of those jobs, you know, as, as looking at, you've had such a, a vast uh, array of things, but at the Queens uh, DA office, and then at, uh, in David Dinkins Man Manhattan Borough President office, um, any, any great stories or, or things you recall from that in terms of whether it's accommodations or just, just your experience there? Well, uh, at the Queens DA's office, they decided to send me into court uh, way before a person who was hired on the same day. And the reason they sent me into court on this particular day is that my boss had found out it was my birthday. Mm -hmm. So they said, we're going to send you into court. You're going to do great. And, uh, when uh, afterward, we're all going to go out and have drinks. And I'm petrified. And I go into court, and they call this case the State versus Ronald Galella. Five years before my death. I may not remember my name, but I'm going to remember Ronald Galella. And I get up, and I very articulately explain that Mr. Galella suffers from mental disease or disability and cannot assist his counsel and therefore must be sent to a psychiatric uh, clinic. And I nailed what I was supposed to say. So I'm very happy now. And everything would have been fine. Uh, it was 38 years ago, and I wouldn't be telling you about it, Scott, ex but for the fact that the defense attorney gets up and says, we totally agree with the prosecution. However, Your Honor, Mr. Galella has written you a letter. And as long as you read his letter, he will abide by any decision you make. So they pass the letter up to the judge. He reads the letter. He gives it back to the defense attorney. But I know that whenever the judge participates with in any activity with the defense, he has to share it with the prosecutor. So I stepped up and adjusted my jacket, and I said to the court clerk, well, I'd like to take a look at that letter. He said, you want to look at the letter? So I now realize that my blindness is known throughout the courthouse. And so he hands me the letter, and I know, Scott, that I can't read the letter. And for some reason, I didn't want to give it to a colleague and then take it back. So I just hold it up to my face, like how, that's how I usually read. And I'm moving the letter around. The court clerk tries to take it, and I admonish him that I have a right to read this letter. And I'm back to reading the letter. And I hear this murmur all over the courtroom, like something is going terribly wrong. And one of my colleagues, another prosecutor, comes up. And he says, David, please give them back the letter. The defendant is insane. He didn't write a letter. He just wrote the letter G up and down the page. For the last two minutes, you've been reading a page full of Gs, and everyone behind you can see it because you held it up. So I handed a letter back, and I felt like that scene, you probably remember, Scott, of the cowardly lion and the Wizard of Oz, that when the wizard yells at him, he runs out and dives through a window. If they had been an, an egress where I could have di dived through a window, I would have. Uh, but my boss said to me, listen, I sent you in there to get somebody in a mental hospital. He's in a mental hospital. I consider it a good effort. And um, that gave me the impetus to come back to work the next yeah, day. Yeah, that's a great story. I think we've all had those moments. That's a great story. Governor, there's a very interesting story about you and Muhammad Ali. Uh, would, you, would you share that with us? Well, uh, I guess it's with Muhammad Ali and myself because uh, yeah. I couldn't see how I'd ever be... <laughs> 
get top billing yes. over Muhammad Ali. Meeting Muhammad Ali, right. So there was an anti-apartheid right, uh, uh, march that was going to occur in 1986. I've been in the legislature three months. And so even though I'm now a state senator, I'm awed by all the people I'm meeting and the, the, and the way the marches are held. This wasn't my career design. It just was kind of an accident that I uh, ran for office in the first place. And so uh, um, walking around, and the person who usually traveled with me wasn't there that day. And whoever did travel with me, I just don't remember who it was, but they weren't around me. And um, so some of the uh, elected officials said to Muhammad Ali as he arrives, and no one even knew he was coming. It was a surprise. They said, you should come and meet the youngest state senator. Uh, he's one of the, he's the third youngest state senator ever elected in New York State. So... Um, he comes up to me. He says, hi. But I don't recognize him. So I said, hi, how are you doing? I shook his hand and I kept going. So he turns to the other elected officials and says, you see, this is why all of you are so out of touch. This guy over here doesn't even know who I am. <laughs> so uh, uh, David Dinkins, who would eventually become mayor of the city of New York, went up to Muhammad Ali and he explained to him, he doesn't recognize you. He's blind. And Muhammad Ali apparently was really taken aback at himself for making fun of me. And he comes over to me and he puts his arm around me and he holds my hand and he says to me um, something I didn't understand because his voice was already weakened. And then he leaned over and he said, would you march with me? And Scott, I felt like the prom date. Like, yeah, would I march with you? Yes, yes, I'll march with you. And so we start marching uh, down the street and, and behind me, I can hear all the other elected officials, because I'm the youngest one there. You know, elected officials are very territorial and they're very, uh, you know, it's, it's time served and seniority. So I'm not supposed to be there. I've got Muhammad Ali on my right and some guy named Arthur Ashe. I think he was a tennis player. He's on my left and they're just taking pictures all over the place. And I'm the only one in the, in the pictures who's from the neighborhood. And finally, they're screaming and Muhammad Ali says to me, well, what, what's this commotion about? And I said, well, you know, I'm the youngest elected official, and so they think I should be in the back. And he said, well, I was the youngest heavyweight champion of all time. You deserve to be in the front right next to me. And we marched uh, the, the rest of the parade, and it was uh, very exciting. That's a great story. And you brought up being the youngest. So elected at age 31, right, to the New York State Senate. And it was the, the seat that your father had held as well. And so what sparked you to do that? What was your motivation for that? You know, most of the time, uh, my father had nothing to do with this. He was loving and caring, and he probably played basketball and, and other sports with the kids in the neighborhood more than the other fathers, even though he was the busiest. And yet, um, you know, I graduated high school early and everyone tells me, uh, you know, of course, you know, you're a chip off the old block and I get into Columbia University and I'm a chip off the old block. But when I left school f during that time, when I almost, you know, got put out of the school, uh, I became a big disappointment. So I came to the conclusion that you can't win being second generation to a famous person. And uh, I just went to work for uh, David Dinkins when he was running for Manhattan Borough President. And one night he couldn't speak someplace and the person who usually took his place wasn't available, so they sent me. And they were very upset that Mr. Dinkins hadn't come and they yelled at me for an hour and a half. Every question I answered, as far as they were concerned, was wrong. And finally, it all ends when the head of the organization stopped it and he said, listen, don't take it personally, but your candidate didn't come tonight. And that's why these people are so angry. And I said, I totally understand this. And this woman moving her hand, she's like in the first row. I could see it. And she says, I have one more question. I'm like, why? You know, I, I, we, I'm dead. Why are we burning the body? You know? And she says to me, I want you to know that I'm not supporting your candidate because he didn't come here tonight. I said, I understand that, ma'am. And she said, but I will say this, young man, I was very impressed at the way you sat here and answered our questions, even though you knew we were insulting you. That's the character I think an elected official should have. And I want to know when you're running for something, because when you get old enough to run for something, I'll help you. And she got up and clapped. And I guess she was sort of the 
senior person in the organization, they all got up and clapped for me. And now I'm fighting back tears. I can't believe this is happening. And uh, we called her bluff because three weeks later, the uh, state senator passed away. And she was among those who organized with me and I ran for office and won. I would find out a year later that she was married. to She was the cousin of a cousin of mine on, on the other side of the family. So, uh, wow, worked out pretty that's, well. That's amazing. So, so let, we'll move to Albany with you then in this story, right? So now you, 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 you now you're you're in the Senate, and um, in in 2003 you get elected as the Senate Minority Leader. At that time, the the uh, the first uh, non-white legislative leader in the history of New York, and the highest ranking. Um, African-American elected official in, in the state of New York, in the history of the state of New York. And uh, it had been 92 years since a legislative leader had been unseated. In other words, the way a legislative leader left is they died or they retired. And uh, the members were very upset at the current leader, and I was actually his deputy. So I felt like Van Johnson and the Kane Mutiny. On one hand, I understand that... Uh, captain is a little out of control. On the other hand, the captain's always been very good to me, so I shouldn't, uh, you know, be challenging him for the leadership. But uh, I was finally talked into doing it, and um, it was, uh, it kind of shocked uh, the Albany dynasty, which, you know, really, uh, you know, rarely has any surprises. And I became the minority leader and was able to win back seats to seize control from uh, the other party, the Republicans and the Democrats wound up in control of the Senate. And this was a dream that many of us had. And I was amazed that I would be the one to make it come true. So in, in 2006, then, when uh, uh, Elliot Spitzer asked you, right, to, to run for lieutenant governor, why did you do that instead of staying in the Senate? Did you, you had such a position there and the Democrats would be in control? What you know, Scott, I get interviewed often, and we go over this uh, scenario often, but you're the f not the first one on a short list of three who asked me why I ran for lieutenant governor, because lieutenant governor's job, if you didn't know, is to wake up at 6.30 in the morning and call the governor's house. If he answers, your work is done for the day. So I um, ran for lieutenant governor because I realized that the Republicans— that I had outsmarted them and would, instead of dividing up the fundraising resources and distributing among all our candidates, I gave it to candidates that I thought could win against Republicans. And I have now cut the margin that they had to two. So in 2006, I could tell they're on to me now. So I will not be outspending them any place. And, but I realized that Governor Spitzer had the fundraising capacity to help me win the Senate. So when he asked me if I'd run for lieutenant governor, I told him I would do it on two accounts. One, that he helped me win the Senate. And number two, that if there was an opening in the U.S. Senate, because all of us believed that Hillary Clinton would run and win for president, that he would name me the U.S. Senator. He agreed to both, except that he admonished me but remember, if you get in any, any trouble, I can't do that. So physician, heal thyself. We moved on, and I became lieutenant governor. So then as lieutenant governor, um, other than calling the governor early in the morning, uh, you, you set out to, to actually make it more than a ceremonial position, if we can say that without uh, stepping on toes. But you set out to make it more than that. Tell us some of your accomplishments, the things that, that you really sought to do in that lieutenant governor role. Well, Governor Spitzer, who had a tremendous confidence in himself, was not at all intimidated by the fact that he had a lieutenant governor who wanted to participate. So he let me uh, uh, guide domestic violence policy, energy policy, minority and women's business enterprises, which weren't getting enough of the state procurement, uh, you know, issues involving people with disabilities, and also stem cell research. So I had five areas that I really worked on during that time, and I was uh, quite gratified that he allowed me to do that. Yeah. 
Well, that's tremendous. I, I know you you had a lot of accomplishments there, and then and then the day the day came, right? The, the day came. The day March came. Tenth. March tenth. Two thousand and eight. So tell us just a little bit there. I know you've spoken a lot about it, but, it, but I, it's such a great story. Tell us. I just uh, went to work, and uh, it seemed a little strange. They said the governor Spitzer hadn't gotten to Albany, and. I'm on the third floor where the halls of the legislature are, but the staff work on the second floor, and my staff has noticed that none of his staff has showed up, and he hasn't as well. So I'm, you know, working there, and and they asked me to cover an event for the governor, and I did that. And then they said, the cardinal is coming at 1 o'clock. We need you to be there. The governor can't be there. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Has everybody here lost their mind? That is protocol. It's head of state to head of state. That would be as if the Queen of England came to Washington to see President Bush, and he doesn't feel like seeing her, so he sends Cheney. And uh, then I added, but in that case, he was running the government anyway, so it might have been appropriate. But here it's not. By the way, President Bush laughed when I told him that I shared that story with him once. But uh, I um, find out at about five minutes after one, this incredible story about a prostitution scandal. And I've been told that you will be governor at 2.15 p.m. It's now 1.05. So I, uh, my father, who I called, uh, suggested to me that I contact the other state elected officials. And I call them all up. And the one that calls back first is the one I thought was the most busy, Hillary Clinton. And she said to me, uh, there is something very ominous about this call, David. Is something wrong? And I said, well, Senator, I guess it's wrong, but what's going to happen is in about a half hour, I'm going to be sworn in as governor. Oh, my goodness, what's happened? And I said, no, uh, the governor's fine. It's just that he's going to resign. And she said, well, why is he resigning, David? And I guess I didn't answer quickly enough. And she said, David, why is he resigning? And I said to myself, how do you explain a sex scandal to Hillary Clinton? Yeah. <laughs> and so that fortunately, uh, the governor postponed his resignation uh, and allowed me a few days to, to organize so that I could, uh, you know, yeah. to, to, with very little time to prepare, assume the role of governor. Wow. I know you had your, your, your father and... Um some advice there and then uh, other elected officials. I'm sure you had no shortage of people telling you what you needed to do and how to do it and all of that. How did you how did you manage during that time? Do you, can you recall just sort of how? It was extremely difficult and stressful. Yeah. It, nothing like this had ever happened. And of course, with Governor Spitzer's impeccable re reputation as the clean Wall Street uh, sheriff and he, you know, uh, stamps out any kind of misconduct any place he sees it, for him to be caught in this and the fact that he was very antagonistic and had an acrimonious relationship with the legislature, this was just a shock. And I think that the entire planet of Albany started to wobble on its axis. People called me up and asked me for things that... People called me up and told me that Spitzer was appointing them to a position next week, and uh, would I uh, go along with it? It turns out it was a fictitious story to, to, and a power grab by everyone. A certain individual said that they wouldn't certify that I was governor unless we had a meeting. This was a direct attempt to shake down the new governor, and I basically told the individual what they could do with themselves and reminded them that now that there's a new administration, everyone from the old administration has to resign, and I can't wait to accept that person's resignation. I actually, in the end, didn't uh, get rid of them, but, but all of this made me not particularly assured. Not too many people were dropping by to help me as much as they were trying to help themselves. Yeah. So you're now governor, right? Congratulations. You have a over $21 billion deficit to, uh, to handle at that point. So tell us what, what that was like. I can only imagine the conversations that had to be had during that time. It was very difficult because the state had been under uh, the rule of Governor Pataki for 12 years, and he had ideological differences with the Democrats. And when Governor Spitzer came in, he sort of took the 
uh, a lot of uh, Governor Pataki's ideas and continued them. And they weren't all bad ideas. But when I came in, I came from the legislature. I had been there for 23 years. So by that point, there really was no uh, uh, doubt that I was going to do the right thing. What happened was that the wrong thing happened. This was 2008. The fiscal crisis hit New York more than any place else because 22.5% of New York's revenues come directly from Wall Street profits. So when Wall Street fell apart, first goes the government and then goes the real estate industry. And that's exactly how it happened. So trying to get people to understand that we have to cut, that we have to uh, eliminate uh, services, and taxing the rich. There weren't enough rich people between Albany and Jupiter to pay for all of the debt that we had. And so my reputation took a real hit during that time because it just became open season uh, on attacking me as if... uh, This was my whole agenda, and I was treated as if I had become a traitor to the quality of life uh, issues that I had run on and had believed in. And I didn't change my beliefs. I changed the way I governed because of the fiscal crisis. Now, uh, on his first day in office, my successor, Governor Andrew Cuomo, said, where would we have been if we didn't have Governor Patterson guiding Uh, our fiscal policy for the last three years. And somehow when the governor said that, it vanquished me of all of the scores I wanted to settle or just frustration at the way I'd been treated during that time. Because if we hadn't done it this way, we would have wound up like places such as California, Arizona, Illinois, that have terrible budget problems and huge pension debt that they'll never be able to pay off. Gotcha. It seemed as though you were not only treated unfairly, maybe when it came to sort of how you handled the the budget deficit, but but also with your vision loss and how you navigated that. Can you talk to us a little bit about your thoughts, you know, Saturday Night Live and others and how they sort of portrayed you and how you how you handled your vision loss and your your use of, of skills in that regard? Well, throughout my career, my blindness was kind of an asset. People talked about how I was able to overcome these disabilities, how I had uh, handled it in the legislature and that kind of thing. But it seemed as if the minute I became governor and the one of the heads of uh, the National Federation of the Blind, Carl Jacobson, said to me that... Uh, The problem is when you get in charge, people now worry that your disability is impeding your performance and you shouldn't be there in the first place. And I got a lot of that. Uh, There was a major uh, figure in my administration. He was my secretary, who was the governor's chief of staff. He had to resign. The New York Post writes an editorial called The Governor's Eyes and how he was always reading to me, and now I didn't have anyone to read to me, and this would be a problem. There were 200,000 people on the state payroll, and the last I checked, all of them know how to read. In other words, it was not only vicious, it was ignorant. So then, of course, I think these articles, there was another article that I had made a statement, uh, don't worry, we will be building at ground zero. Now, I knew we had started building, but it was so minuscule that people were afraid that the 10th commemoration of the uh, attack on the country on September 11th, we wouldn't have anything there. Uh, so they write an editorial, someone should take the governor down to uh, the site and let him touch the building so he'll know that we, we've that his administration, they've already started building there. And this culminated on December 6th of 2008, when Saturday Night Live does this, uh, you know, this kind of uh, caricature of me, who's not only blind, but is stupid. The sort of Mr. Magoo character, walking into walls, holding maps upside down, unable to communicate well. And uh, my press corps laughed and said, we're going to write, that's really funny. Now let's let the governor come on and speak for himself. And I refused to do it. And um, a few, not enough of them, but a few of the disability organizations 
came to my defense after that. And uh, it, you know, took me back to times I was ridiculed as a child and that kind of thing. And I put up with it for about two years. And finally, a very good friend of mine uh, said to me, listen, David, uh, you did the right thing. You fought Saturday Night Live, but they've offered you a chance to go on there. Now go on there and get even with them. And so I did. I went on and they apologized to me. And I said, you all made so much fun of me for being blind that I forgot I was black. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. That's a good one. I, you know, I, I know um, a lot of people with vision loss can sort of face those criticisms, maybe not to the extent that you did, not to the extent that it's obviously Saturday Night Live and other things. But um, it, it, it's noted that in your official gubernatorial uh, portrait that was done of you, you have your cane uh, leaning against the wall behind you. Um, well, tell well, us about that. Well, you know, Scott, um, I've never used a cane. Yeah. But I remembered the length with which President Roosevelt tried to cover up his disability. He practiced swimming in the mansion. Would I ever believe when I studied about Roosevelt Columbia that I would swim in the same pool that he did in the mansion? But he was going to walk into the Democratic Convention to accept the nomination in 1932. When he starts walking in, he was actually doing fine. But people who want to help you, they came and picked him up and carried him in. And uh, my professor showed me this picture of him just totally frustrated that these people took away his desire to walk in and look strong. You know, just in terms of, uh, you know, my situation, uh, I always wanted people to know that I am blind. Like, I wasn't like that as a young person, but I don't run away from it. And I don't talk about being legally blind, like you're better than people who are totally blind, or any of this, you know, uh, these, uh, you know, definitions. The fact is, that uh, when I'm out in public, I'm moving as a blind person. Now, I had the ability to move around without using a cane, but I remembered that it was written of Ronald Reagan that he wore a hearing aid all the time when he was president, except when he was on camera, because he wanted to promote that same feeling of strength that uh, President uh, Roosevelt did. So I decided to put a cane in the picture to indicate that if I need it one day, I will use it, uh, as opposed to people who feel ashamed that they need help or that there's equipment that is help. I want people to know they should use it and don't use it because you're ambivalent. Use it with pride. Yeah. So then you have this this career and, and reach the highest level of, of state government in New York. And, and now how do you feel about being a role model to other individuals? It's um, surprising when someone says it to me. And uh, uh, I remember uh, this guy stopped me on the street one day and he said, you know, Governor, we did this um, drug rehabilitation event together and it was so great for me to be there. And uh, I've just always admired you. And I said, well, thank you so much. Uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, tell me your name. And he said, try Smokey Robinson, who's the singer. And of course, I don't recognize him as usual. But um, I think that, um, that I embrace it, that uh, my struggles, the successes, and maybe even more importantly, the struggles uh, were why I tried to document them in a book and tried to keep a sense of humor about it because if you lose that, you kind of lose everything. And that's why it was very easy for me to, to reproduce those situations where I felt pain, where I felt success, and uh, my vision, uh, if you will, at uh, how the world could change and we could learn to interact with each other a little better than we do right now. Yeah. You had a review of your book where a reporter said that, uh, I believe, uh, quote, you were the most human governor uh, in more than 20 years um, in the state of New York. Now, without getting us in trouble with any other governors, we don't want to do that to you. But what are your thoughts about that, the most human? I think that uh, I did things differently. Uh, 
you know, even in the depths of my uh, difficulties there, I would stand right in front, in front of the press and take their questions. Um, I didn't try to hide uh, my blindness. I signed a bill once where I put my face on the desk. It's the only way I could sign it. And the New York Times puts the picture in the newspaper but doesn't say why my face is on the desk, which I thought was horrific journalism. And there was this kind of dispute back and forth all day in the media about whether that was right or whether it was wrong, that kind of thing. And finally, uh, closing the NBC Nightly News, as he did every night at the time, Brian Williams said, here's a picture of the governor of New York, and there's been a lot of controversy about what he's doing. And my answer is he's working. And that just empowered me to hear him say that. So I tried to be, you know, myself, um, you know, where I did things that were wrong. I tried to get up and say it. Uh, I remember we were supposed to send supplies to Haiti. There'd been a, a hurricane there, and the supplies never got further than a um, some warehouse in the Bronx. And uh, the reporter looks into the TV, and I'm actually sitting right in front of the TV watching it, and he says, Governor, you've got a lot of explaining to do. Like, he's talking directly to me. And so I went to the press conference the next day, and they wrote up this explanation that blamed everyone except us. And I got up and I said, overnight, we've conducted an investigation as to whose fault it is that those supplies were in the Bronx and not in Haiti. And I'm here to tell you who it is. You're looking at him. And I went through, you know, that it wasn't my job to fly the supplies to Haiti or to command it on a ship, but it was on me to make sure that it got there. And I didn't do that. And after the press conference, the media just kept harassing the Haitian le leaders, trying to get them to say something bad about me. And they wouldn't because I knew it was a mistake. I actually knew it wasn't my mistake, but it was my responsibility. Yeah. In your book, which uh, was released uh, in 2020, uh, Black, Blind, and In Charge, um, great book, by the way. Thank you for putting that out and sharing a lot of the stories. Oftentimes in writing a book, there's things you leave out uh, for various reasons. Uh, anything you left out of there that, that you really wanted to put in, but... Uh, Maybe one story I did leave out, which will be an advance to for whatever else I write, Scott, is right. one day I'm walking down the street, I'm 16, and my friend is walking with me, and there's a very old man standing by a car and he's standing there with a woman and the woman comes up and says, listen, my father will pay you guys if you will change a tire for him. And uh, the father is actually trying to change the tire. And finally, he lets my friend change the tire and he gives him a dollar. And um, he says to me, um, do you know how to change a tire? And I said, no. He says, well, I'll teach you right now. And I said, well, I have a severe sight disability, so I don't think I'll ever have a car. So he said, well, you might not have a car, but it looks to me like you could change this tire. And I said, no, that's okay, that's fine. Well, he gave me a dollar anyway, and I went along. And, uh, state of the State Address, 2000, and uh, uh, I guess it was 1994, 1995, so this is 25 years later. We're driving back from Albany. I'm with three of my assistants. They're all women, and the car stops, and they get outside the car, and they have no idea how to change a tire. So what they did is they actually jacked the wheel up, but they hadn't taken the wheel off. So the wheel is still on the car. So the wheel is rotating, and they wanted me to hold the wheel while they tried to smash the lug nuts to change it. You're supposed to do that when the wheel's still on the ground. I didn't know that, neither did they. And each time they smash one of those lug nuts, it shakes the tire and it shakes me. I feel like I've been hit by Mike Tyson. And finally, this, this man just drives up and goes, what are you all doing? He can say, just get away, get away. And he you know, lowers the car, takes the lug nuts off, and then jacks the car up to put the other tire on. And I'm standing there, just looking up, cold, it's 20 degrees, and I see the face of the older man saying to me, you see, I told you I could have taught you how to, how to change a tire, yeah. and you wouldn't have been in this mess that yeah. you're in now. <laughs> so that's a great lesson for the teenagers, right? Listen, Absolutely. Listen to the... the... It, 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 there's nothing... Yeah that if someone wants to teach you, you shouldn't bother to learn it because you never know when you're gonna use that skill.
You know, and I think it, it's so true, and I think for a lot of people with vision loss, that that sort of either people don't give the opportunity or, you know, the self-esteem of the visually impaired individual is such that, that maybe they don't feel like they're capable of doing it. So that's certainly one of the one of the things at Alpha Point that we, you know, strive to do is is work on that, um, that aspect of the person understanding that they are capable. Governor, there is a, a, a great story. You have so many of them, but there's a great story in your book about a date you went on with a young lady named Connie. Would you just tell us about that? Because I think it, it it touches a lot of people who are visually impaired and, and going through certain things. Would you I, share I, with us? I had a secretary. I was working for the NAACP at the time, and she said, you'd be great for my friend Connie. So this, you know, kind of blind date, uh, we meet and we go to this restaurant. We're sitting at the table, and um, I had put some salt on my salad. I put it down and then I was fumbling around. I couldn't find it. And finally she says, I'll hand you the salt. And she handed it to me. I thanked her. And she said, um, why did you look around for the salt? Why didn't you ask me for it in the first place? You know, you do things and it's not as if you can explain everything you did. I said, you know, probably because I had just used the salt. So I knew the salt was on the table. So, you know, I knew eventually I could find it. And she said, well, you have trouble asking others for help, don't you? And I, you know, just try to change the conversation. And then um, I said something about my brother. And she said, have you grown up feeling inferior because your brother has total vision and you don't? And I'm like, you know what? I just want this dinner to end. I can put this woman in a taxi and never have to see her again. Well, she comes up with the bright idea that I ride her at 1130 at night from 96th Street and Broadway, which is still a, a, a little distance from where I live, to the New Lots station in Brooklyn, which is the last stop on the IRT. And then we take a taxi to her house. And I'm now furious. You know, it's like almost 1230 in the morning. And I said, listen, when you get out, because the, the plexiglass was preventing us from, from communicating with the driver, I said, tell the driver, I want to go to the Long Island Railroad station uh, um, where, where the uh, stain, uh, station begins. She says, no, we have a stop right here in East New York. It's only five minutes away. I said, I don't want to go there. I want to go to the Long Island Railroad train station where it actually begins. The driver drives me, and here's a mistake I made. I just didn't seem like this big, um, uh, you know, uh, entry point that, that uh, existed in, 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 yeah. in Brooklyn. And um, so I get out and I walk and now I realize I'm at the station in East New York, which had the highest crime rate in the city at the time in 1983. It's the first warm night of the year. And I've got a three piece suit on and a suitcase that says, has money, mug him. So I go into the station and I go up there and I'm waiting and the trains keep going past the station because after a certain hour, they don't stop in East New York. Then finally, at 1.30 in the morning, I see a train. It's going the other way. It's going back into Brooklyn, but it looks like it's coming to a start. And I run down the stairs, run through the hall, knock somebody over, I think. I hope they survived. Ran up the stairs. I hear the bell. They're going to close the door. And I dive head first through the door, because I wanted to be able to get my hands on the door in case it was closing, and the door closes behind me, and a, another passenger gets up, and he goes like this, he goes, safe. I said, you don't know <laughs> how much that means to me. I then proceed to tell him the story, and the next morning, I don't even go to work, because I don't get back to Long Island, where I'm living, until five after four in the morning. So I call my boss the next morning, I said, look, I'll be in when I wake up, and then I get a call from Connie, who says to me that the reason she had me take her home is that I have to learn that um, there's certain things that are out of my ability to do, and I have to admit to it. So this whole thing has been this psychological profile being compiled by a social worker. And so uh, suffice it to say, the comments I had for Connie were not the type that we would discuss yeah. here. They did not lead to a second date. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, no, there yeah, was no okay. second date. <laughs> uh, as a foresight question, we, we ask a foresight question for our series. If you could change one thing uh, about the future for people who are blind, what would you change? I think 
that I would, uh, in a lot of the service organizations, really spend more time on the individual's actual feelings about themselves and about life and and uh, and uh, periods in their life. So, for instance, one of the big problems for all disabled students is after high school because they might actually intellectually be able to handle the material, but the socialization around it, many uh, disabled people are sort of separated. I remember I was probably the most popular kid in the class, but, uh, eighth grade, freshman high school, I don't remember when it happened. Somebody had a party and I knew him well. He didn't invite me. He didn't see me as part of the social uh, you know, community in the school. He saw me as a, uh, a, you know, an academic. And so this kind of typecasting really hurts, particularly young people, because young people, you know, mistreat each other, bully each other, cast system each other. And uh, I think what I would want is for the service uh, organizations to really start working with the socialization of the students as much as the academics, because it's extremely important to the human psyche that somebody feel uh, like they have value in all areas of, of living. Right. I didn't really feel that way. And uh, so just a little anecdote, I didn't really start dating until I was 22 or 23 years old. And of course, it was easier for me to date uh, someone who was younger because now I didn't feel, you know, so overwhelmed. So I actually attended the high school graduation of my first girlfriend at age 23. She was 18. The proctor was 24. He was trying to get into law school. I was already in law school, so he spends all night asking me how about the application process. And that's the result, I think, of the fact that too much attention was paid to the educational aspect of learning, but not enough to m having the person feel like a viable person in society. Yeah. How do you see the future for people who are blind? What, what do you think that looks like from a technology standpoint, employment? What does that look like to you? Well, one of my fears about the future for any um, group of people that is now um, making their way is that external circumstances can impede it. So obviously during COVID, it impacted uh, people with disabilities to a greater extent, um, the same kind of services uh, to, to some degree were impaired just because of the government's budgetary problems and also just the issues of, of uh, distance and travel and, 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 and the like. And so what I think um, can happen now is that, that we get refocused. Uh, none of the government websites had real accessibility for the blind until 2014, 2015, which is a shame when they, when they finally um, uh, made the Social Security website and the Board of Elections, uh, national elections, um, accessible at that particular time. So from a governmental perspective, we've got a long way to go because it's just a, a lot that's, that's not available. And then you have uh, people uh, like myself who got to a point where there was just no assistance in some of the areas that we studied in or the areas that we were trying to work in. And you just have to, you know, find creative ways to try to solve the problem. And you can't always do that. So, but I think the outlook is very positive because, uh, you know, now uh, we had a woman run for lieutenant governor in Maryland as a blind person, as a Republican, the same time that I ran uh, in New York. And you've got people uh, with other disabilities, uh, uh, you know, rising to the highest levels of, of government. And with that, is, I think, a new understanding of how to yeah. interact with people who have disabilities. I think the most important thing is whoever you are, you have to be proud of it. Yeah. 
So it's not like I'm proud of being David Patterson. Oh, and by the way, I have this blindness issue. I, I'm proud of that too. I'm proud of the fun that I can make of it. I'm proud of the fact that in spite of the times that it worked uh, very much to make me feel uh, that I couldn't achieve and, and some depression that probably came with it at the time, but the fact that I was able to get over it. And I'm proud of the other people who are in these situations who realize that life can be better and, and work hard to do that. So if you can be proud of uh, your heritage, you can be proud of your race, you can be proud of your religion, you can be proud of your national origin, you can be proud of all the things about you that make you who you are. And there's no one around to tell you that you can't that you can't do that. Yeah. In terms of uh, Alpha Point specifically, so you know we we have a wide range of jobs, and that's one of the things that we've tried to do is meet people where they are. Um, you know, some people have have gotten a higher level of education, and and maybe they want to pursue a job that's IT related. But not everybody is, is at that level, either in education or in other skill development. So it's one thing we've tried to do is have jobs at all different skill levels so that um, not that someone necessarily stays where they are. If, if they want to grow, then they can do that. Do you see that as a, I mean, as a, as a positive way of approaching that situation with people with vision loss? I think that um, uh, in, you know, in terms of an effort made by an organization, that if you can meet the skill level and find jobs for people who have that uh, skill level, you've wiped out a long process of training. Uh, then uh, correlative to that would be that you would um, want to recognize the areas that people need to go in and they don't really have the training and try to identify ways to give them the skills and training that they would need to, to hold those jobs. It's, um, it's a very interesting dynamic. And frankly, the fact that we're even talking about it right now, when uh, we still have large unemployment in the deaf population, nearly 90%, and uh, even in the blindness population, at, you know, uh, over 60%, and, and for other disabilities as well, I... Um, think about the fact that if a if one of the government agencies actually dedicated the, themselves to employing the disabled and in this case the blind in areas where it could be you know extremely helpful i think it would send a message to the private sector as well yeah and so and i know that you with your book right black blind and in charge so i, I know you you certainly your your heritage from african american standpoint where, where do you see that today i mean obviously there's been a lot that's gone on what what are your thoughts i know you're talking about the wealth wealth creation what what other areas do you see that that need to still be worked on well i think that uh education is still uh, a real issue um the number of black people in college now are less than there were in 1978 that's strange but it's actually true even though there are more people in the country uh the the um uh you know i think that at the at some of the higher levels of government there are uh those who in spite of whatever went on in their childhood and in their schooling have amassed great wealth or tremendous capital managers, developers, um, um, private equity uh, investors uh, of, um, you know, who are African-American, Hispanic-American, uh, people of uh, some foreign descent here in this country who are kind of shut out of that process. And I think there needs to be some change. And one of the changes that I would bring is to have the Social Security Administration expand on a program where well, you can start a private equity firm even though you're not an accredited investor. Now, that may be a little complicated, but just to know that there would be ways to enable people with lesser salaries to start saving and creating their own wealth, which they uh, probably never were encouraged to do. And I think we should bring this into our schools. I think that they should have a course in college called LIFE, like how to open a bank account, how to get a mortgage on a house, how to uh, buy a car, 
these things that people get out of school, they have no idea what they're doing. Their parents usually help them. Uh, it, I think it would uh, uh, really be um, beneficial. Actually, I told my mother that when I, when I was 18 or 19, and she scoffed at the idea. But the same school that she once taught at uh, Hunter College put in a class like that a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say you're most proud of? What are your biggest accomplishments in, in your mind, despite what maybe other people might think? What, what are your biggest accomplishments? Well, there are large accomplishments, uh, accomplishments, and then there are small ones, but they touched me. So, for instance, uh, closing a $21.3 billion budget and doing it on time, I don't think anything like that will happen in the state of New York in the near or far future. Then, totally reorganizing the uh, economic development policy of the state to include women and minority-owned firms who combined with getting 5% of the contracts uh, when I came into office in 2008. And Governor Spitzer, my friend, I love him, but in the year he was there, nothing happened. And in the three years I was there, we got that number up to over 16%. Uh, that meant a lot to me. And uh, writing the original hate crimes bill it was passed under someone's name, but uh, other than mine, but the fact that, uh, that it became a national movement meant a lot to me. Um, locating and advocating for a cemetery in Lower Manhattan, which was uh, one of the first burial grounds for African Americans, and having it memorialized and being a uh, uh, um, uh, erected as a national landmark. Those were big things I did. Yeah. But then there are small things. It was a young man named King Wu. He was Chinese and he grew up in Chinatown. He got involved with a gang and they were, I don't know, trying to rob a Brinks truck like these teenagers just, <laughs> uh, they all got arrested. He became a youthful offender, but he goes back and he gets his uh, GED goes to college, gets a master's, starts a business in Chinatown, and then winds up uh, being appointed by something to the mayor. And they said to him, you know, to be appointed, it'd be better if you applied for citizenship. When, they, when, they, when he applies for citizenship, he's taken to Texas in the Sixth Circuit and is going to be deported by the federal government. Well, I pardoned him for the crime. Now they even had to pay for his trip back from Texas. And while uh, the Obama administration wasn't happy with me, it was the right thing to do. This person had paid their debt to society and now was going to be deported to a place that he'd left China when he was two years old. So it was a little thing, but I really enjoyed doing that. And uh, sometimes as governor, you got to change things for individuals. You can't do it for 19 million people, but you become aware of a situation and you can reach in and give some kind of help. And those probably stay with me longer than, um, you know, the high profile accomplishments. But uh, when you're sitting reevaluating yourself and things you've done, yeah. uh, it's nice to know that sometimes you stuck your nose in where others would not. Yeah. For our time with you, one of the things we did was just ask uh, about employees that might have questions. And so I do have a question from from one of our employees that is, is, is perfect for you, I believe, which is, what do you think that elected officials need to know about people who are blind that they probably don't know because they don't spend a lot of time around someone who's blind necessarily? I think they need to know that blind people, the spectrum of those people who have this disability is as wide as the regular society. We dream of accomplishing the same goals as they do. Uh, we want equal opportunity in education. We want to live in accommodated housing. Uh, we want to be able to send our children to school and be able to communicate with the school. Everything that everybody else wants or everybody else does. And the fact that the disability is there does not in any way impede the progress of the person who really wants to get something done.
Governor, thank you so much uh, for your time with us. We truly appreciate it. It's always an honor to talk with you and to hear your stories and just the inspiration that you are um, to so many people, especially people who have visual impairments and those that that looking at your example, they say, you know, I can achieve, I can, I can do these great things. So thank you for sharing with us and being so open and willing to talk. Well, thank you for having me, Scott. I'm sorry we ran out of time. I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> well, we will talk again. How about that? We'll, that, we'll have that a part two great. at some point. So thank you. It, it, again, it's always an honor, and we look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you as well. Thank you, Governor. Foresight, an Alpha Point series. David Patterson, Governor of New York, 2008 to 2010. Supported by Google. $39 Glasses, Mealy Associates, Golden Fortune, and Jack Molstein. For more information on supporting the Foresight series and AlphaPoint, visit alphapoint.org foresight.